Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. Welcome to Chapter 11 of our Alexander audiobook series, an immersive journey through the intricate tapestry of history. Following the dramatic events of deterioration of character, we now venture into the aftermath, a chapter rich in pivotal moments and transformative decisions. In this chapter, we witness Alexander the Great, now an unchallenged ruler, grapple with the immense responsibilities of governing a vast and diverse empire. No longer just the conqueror, Alexander finds himself at the helm of a new world order, navigating the complex realities of power, administration, and cultural integration. Join us as we continue this enthralling exploration of Alexander's legacy. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more historical narratives. Let's embark on Chapter 11 and uncover the depths of Alexander's empire-building journey. Chapter 11. Deterioration of Character. B.C. 329. Alexander was now 26 years of age. He had achieved all of his ambitious goals. Darius was no longer alive, and Alexander was now the unquestioned ruler of all of Western Asia. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of control over what he believed was the entire world. However, as he gained this power, his personality changed in a negative way. He lost his simplicity, self-control, moderation, and sense of fairness that he had in his early years. He started dressing and behaving like the Persians and lived in their grand palaces, copying their lavishness and opulence. He started to enjoy parties and wine a lot and sometimes drank too much. He had a group of 360 young women, and he spent time with them, indulging in every kind of luxury and pleasure. In simple terms, he had changed completely. The determination, strong personality, and focused pursuit of important goals through careful planning, thinking ahead, hard work, and self-control all vanished. Now, he seemed only interested in feasts, wild parties, and indulging in reckless behavior and immorality, spending entire days and nights in such activities. This situation greatly upset and frustrated the officers of his army. Many of them were older than him and better equipped to resist the temptation of luxury, softness, and wrongdoing. They remained faithful to their initial simplicity and honesty. Despite making some respectful but unsuccessful objections, they distanced themselves from their leader emotionally and strongly criticized his evilness and foolishness amongst themselves. However, many of the young officers imitated Alexander's behavior and became just as vain, irregular, and fond of indulgence as he was. However, despite joining him in his pleasures, there was no strong unity between him and them. The bond that connects friends who simply enjoy each other's company is always weak and fragile. As a result, Alexander slowly lost the trust and affection of his old friends and failed to make any new ones. His officers either didn't like his behavior and kept their distance, or they joined him in his partying and bad behavior, without truly respecting him or feeling any loyalty towards him. Parmenio and his son Philotas were two different types of characters. Parmenio, an old general with extensive experience and fame, had served under Philip, Alexander's father, before Alexander became king. Throughout Alexander's career, Parmenio had been his top lieutenant general, and he consistently relied on him during difficult situations. Parmenio was composed, courageous, fearless, and wise. He restrained Alexander from impulsive actions and played a crucial role in helping him achieve most of his goals. It was common practice in those times for kings to be credited with the accomplishments of their generals and officers. Therefore, the accounts of the Macedonian army's achievements would naturally exaggerate Alexander's involvement 
and downplay Parmenio's contributions. However, nowadays, many unbiased readers believe that there is reason to question whether Alexander would have succeeded in his great expedition if he had not been accompanied by Parmenio. Philotas was Parmenio's son, but they had very different personalities. This distinction is often observed throughout history between those who are born into greatness and those who achieve it through their own efforts. We still observe the same comparison today as the children of the wealthy who inherit their wealth replace modesty, prudence, and virtue with pride, arrogance, self-indulgence, and wastefulness. These qualities were the same ones that helped their ancestors acquire their fortune. Philotus was very proud, bragged a lot, spent too much money, and had many addictions, just like his master Alexander, who indulged in every kind of luxury and pleasure. One day, his father, tired of his arrogant behavior, his bragging and his extravagant lifestyle, advised him to be more humble. But Parmenio's wise advice to his son was ignored. Philotus boasted about how important he was to Alexander and said, Without my father, Parmenio, what would Philip have achieved? And without me, what would Alexander have achieved? These statements reached Alexander, causing suspicion, fear, and hatred to grow between them. Courts and camps are places where people often plan and carry out secret plots against someone. Alexander constantly heard about secret plans and plots against him. The intense love and devotion that he initially inspired in everyone at the beginning of his career had disappeared. His generals and officers were constantly plotting to remove him from power, as he no longer seemed to have the energy to lead. Alexander was always suspicious of these plans and lived in a constant state of unease and anxiety as he tried to uncover and punish them. Finally, a conspiracy happened in which Philotas was involved. One day, Alexander was told that there was a plan to overthrow and harm him. It was said that Philotas had been informed about the plan by one of Alexander's friends so that he could tell the king about it. However, he didn't do that, which made it seem likely that he was working together with the conspirators. Alexander was informed that the leader and creator of this plot was one of his generals named Dimnus. He promptly dispatched an officer to summon Dimnus to him. Dimnus seemed shocked by this request. Instead of following it, he took out his sword, stabbed himself in the heart, and died on the ground. Alexander then called for Philotas and asked him if it was really true that he knew about this plot, but didn't tell anyone. Philotas said someone told him about a plot, but he didn't believe it. He thought people made up these stories to cause trouble, and he didn't think the report he heard was important. But seeing Dimnus's reaction and suicide, Philotus realized it was true and apologized for not telling Alexander sooner. Alexander believed him, thinking he didn't say anything because he didn't believe the plot was real, not because he was involved. So they made up, and Philotus went back to his tent. However, Alexander did not stop discussing the subject there. He convened a council with his most capable and trusted friends and advisors, which included the top officers of his army. He presented the facts to them. They reached a different conclusion than him regarding the guilt of Philotus. They believed him implicated in the crime and demanded his trial. Trial in such a case, in those days, meant putting the accused to the torture, with a view of forcing him to confess his guilt. Alexander yielded to this proposal. Perhaps he had secretly instigated it. The advisors of kings and conquerors, in such circumstances as this, generally have the sagacity to discover what advice will be agreeable. At all events, Alexander followed the advice of his counselors and made arrangements for arresting Philotas on that very evening. These circumstances occurred at a time when the army was preparing for a march, the various generals lodging in tents pitched for the purpose. Alexander placed extra guards in various parts of the encampment, as if to impress the whole army with a sense of the importance and solemnity of the occasion. He then sent officers to the tent of Philotas late at night to arrest him.
the officers found their unhappy victim asleep. They awoke him and made known their errand. Philotus arose and obeyed the summons, dejected and distressed, aware, apparently, that his destruction was impending. The next morning Alexander called together a large assembly, consisting of the principal and most important portions of the army, to the number of several thousands. They came together with an air of impressive solemnity, expecting from the preliminary preparations that business of very solemn moment was to come before them, though they knew not what it was. The feeling of awe and seriousness became even stronger when the assembly saw the dead body of dimness, covered in blood and looking terrifying. Alexander made sure to bring the body in and show it to everyone. The death of dimness had been kept a secret, so when his body was found, it was unexpected and shocking. After the initial surprise and wonder had lessened, Alexander explained to everyone what had happened. He talked about the conspiracy and how one of the people involved had taken their own life. The sight of the body and the king's statement caused a lot of excitement among the people in the assembly. This excitement reached its peak when Alexander announced that he had reason to believe that Philotas and his father Parmenio, who were officers that he trusted and favored, were the ones behind the whole plan. He then told someone to bring Philotas. He came with his hands tied behind him and his head covered. He looked very sad and hopeless. He was indeed put on trial, but he knew that trial meant torture and that he had no hope for a positive outcome. Alexander said he would let the assembly handle the accused and left. The army leaders, who now had complete control over Philotas, listened for a while to his own explanation for his actions. He proved that there was no evidence against him and asked them to be fair and not judge him based on vague guesses. In response, they chose to torture him. There was no evidence, that's true, and they wanted to make up for it by forcing him to confess under torture. Naturally, his fiercest and most unforgiving enemies were chosen to carry out the task. They tortured Philotus using a device called the rack. The rack has wheels and pulleys, and the victim is placed in it, causing their limbs and tendons to be stretched, resulting in intense pain. Philotus endured his torture bravely without showing any signs of pain or distress. This only prompted his executioners to intensify the torment. It is important to note that in this trial, the matter of guilt or innocence was not in question. The only question was, who could endure the most suffering, Philotus or his enemies? Unfortunately, Philotus was ultimately defeated in this competition. He pleaded with them to let him go from the rack, saying he would confess whatever they wanted as long as he could die peacefully. They listened and set him free. When they asked, he admitted that both he and his father were part of the plot. He agreed to answer more questions about the conspiracy and the guilt of certain individuals who were suspected or wanted to be condemned by those conducting the torture. The answers that Philotus gave to these questions were recorded, and he was then sentenced to be stoned. The sentence was carried out immediately. During this time, Parmenio was in media, commanding a crucial part of Alexander's army. It was decided that he had to be killed. However, careful planning was required to ensure his execution while he was far away and leading a large force. The affair had to be done secretly and quickly. The plan was as follows. There was a man named Polydamas who was known as Parmenio's close friend. Polydamas was chosen to go to Media and witness the execution. He was selected because if an enemy or a stranger had been sent, Parmenio would have been suspicious or cautious and would have stayed alert. They gave Polydamas some letters to Parmenio, pretending to be from his friends. One of the letters even had the seal of his son Philotas to make the sad father completely fooled. Polydamas traveled for 11 days to reach Media. He carried letters for Cleander, the governor of the province of Media. These letters authorized Parmenio's execution as ordered by the king. He went to Clender's house at night. He gave him the letters, and they planned how to execute the plan. 
After taking all the necessary precautions, Polydamas went with his attendants to Parmenio's quarters. The elderly general, who was then eighty years old, was walking in his grounds. Polydamas was allowed to approach him and greeted him warmly and friendly. He handed him his letters, and Parmenio read them. He was very happy with what the letters said, especially the one that was written in his son's name. He couldn't tell that it was fake, because it was common back then for secretaries to write letters, and they were only confirmed by the seal. Parmenio was happy to receive good news from Alexander and his son. During their discussion of the letter's contents, Polydamas, who had been waiting for the opportune moment, suddenly produced a concealed dagger and stabbed Parmenio in the side. He quickly pulled it out and stabbed it at his throat. The attendants rushed forward when they saw this and repeatedly stabbed their swords into the fallen body until it stopped breathing. The violent deaths of Parmenio and his son, despite little evidence of their guilt, created a negative impression of Alexander. Shortly after, another case occurred that was even more distressing. It clearly showed that Alexander's mind, once filled with noble ideals of justice and generosity, was now increasingly controlled by selfish and uncontrollable emotions. This case involved Clitus. Clitus was a famous general in Alexander's army and a close friend of the king. He had actually saved Alexander's life once. This happened during the Battle of the Granicus. Alexander had put himself in great danger by fighting in the middle of the battle, and he was surrounded by enemies. The sword of one of them was raised above his head and would have killed him instantly if Clytus had not quickly stepped forward and struck down the man just as he was about to deliver the blow. Acts of loyalty and bravery like this made Alexander trust Clytus a lot. After Parmenio's death, the governor of a key province in the empire stepped down. Alexander chose Clytus to take over the position. On the night before he left to start his new job as the leader, Alexander invited him to a special dinner to celebrate his promotion. Clytus and the other guests came together for the event. They drank wine, as they usually did, and enjoyed themselves. Alexander got excited and started talking, as he was now used to doing, bragging about his own achievements and belittling those of his father, Philip, in comparison. People who are partially drunk tend to argue a lot, and even more so if they are good friends when sober. Clytus had served under Philip. He was now old, and, like other old men, was very attached to the fame that came from his youthful achievements. He felt restless and uneasy when he heard Alexander taking credit for his father Philip's victory at Sharonia. He started murmuring to the people sitting next to him about how kings often claim and receive a lot of credit that they don't deserve. Alexander asked what Clytus said. No one answered. However, Clytus continued talking, getting more and more excited. He praised Philip's character and military achievements, saying they were better than anything in his prime time. The people at the table started arguing about the subject. The old men supported Philip and the past, while the younger ones defended Alexander. Clytus became increasingly excited. He praised Parmenio, who had been Philip's top general, and started questioning the fairness of his recent punishment and death. Alexander replied, and Clytus, standing up and now completely losing his composure, criticized him with harsh and angry words. This is the hand, he said, stretching out his arm, that saved your life during the Battle of the Granicus, and Parmenio's fate shows what kind of gratitude and rewards loyal servants can expect from you. Alexander, furious, told Clytus to leave the table. Clytus obeyed, saying as he moved away, He is correct in not wanting honest men at his table. He is correct. It is appropriate for him to spend his life among uncivilized people and servants who will gladly worship his Persian belt and magnificent robe. Alexander grabbed a javelin to throw it at Clytus's head. The guests stood up in confusion and crowded around him, shouting and arguing with each other. Some held on to Alexander's arm, some tried to quickly take Clytus out of the room, and others loudly accused and threatened each other. They managed to get Clytus out of the room, but once he was in the hall, he broke free from them, 
went back through another door and started insulting Alexander again. The king threw his javelin and hit Clytus, then said, Go and join Philip and Parmenio. The group quickly went to help Clytus, but it was too late. He died right away. Alexander felt deep regret and despair when he regained his senses. He cried a lot for many days when his long-tried and faithful friend died. He hated himself for drinking too much and acting out of anger, which caused the death. However, he couldn't bring Clytus back to life or erase the permanent damage it caused to his reputation. As we conclude Chapter 11 of our enthralling Alexander audiobook series, we appreciate your presence in Alexandria. This chapter has guided us through a pivotal phase of Alexander's reign, showcasing his transformation from a fearless conqueror to a ruler faced with the complexities of empire management. Now, we eagerly anticipate Chapter 12, Alexander's End. This final chapter promises to be a riveting narrative, chronicling the last years of Alexander's life, marked by his continued expeditions, the strains of leadership, and ultimately, his untimely demise. We'll explore the significant events that culminated in Alexander's tragic end and how these moments offer a deeper understanding of his character, a blend of ambition, vulnerability, and the toll of power. Join us in Chapter 12 as we delve into the concluding part of our series, witnessing the end of an era and the lasting impact of Alexander's legacy on the world. Click on the upcoming video link or find it in the description below. Remember to subscribe to Alexandria for more fascinating historical narratives. Like this video to support our channel, share this journey through the past with others, and stay tuned as we unveil the final chapter in the saga of Alexander the Great.